All right, Jabo say good morning. Good morning. Let us let us begin. Begin by thanking all of our sponsors for this morning. Share to thank our Tamatara sponsor for the month of Shvat. Mrs. Salma Wolf for dedicating all the Sherman's Rushos this month with immense gratitude for the Rafuos from Hashem and the merit of a Rafuos for all of those in need in the schus of our brave soldiers and the schus of the return of our hostages. To thank our week of learning sponsors, Sayyid and Sima Haken, in memory of Sayyid's mother, Taji Batari Bas Harav Mayor Moshe Zichron Livracha. We hope that in the merit of our Talmud Torah, her and the Sham will have an Aliyah and the family in the Chama. And to thank our Dafyomi sponsor for today, I'm sorry, Dafyomi sponsor for today, Jeremy Diamond, for dedicating the Shir this morning, creation of the yard site of his father, of his father, uh, Abe Diamond, Zichron Livracha. We hope that in the merit of our Talmud Torah, the Sham will have an Aliyah and the family in the Chama. And I both say we dedicate our learning to all of the soldiers who, who fell in battle. There was a, there was a building explosion in, in Gaza that claimed the lives of 21 soldiers in, in battle. So we dedicate our, we dedicate our learning, the Ili Nishmas, Matan Lazar, Hadar Kapeluk, Sergei Guntemer, Elkana Yehuda Svez, Yuval Lopez, Yoav Levi, Nicholas Berger, Sidrik Garin, Rafael Elias Mosheov, Barak Chaim, Ben Valid, Ahmad, Abu Latif, Nir Binyamin, Elkanah Vizel, Israel Sokol, Ariel Mordechai Wolfstal, Sagi Idan, and Mark Kononovich. Um, in addition to in addition to Uriel Aviat Silberman, Eyal Mirubach Toto, uh, Eli Levi, David Natiaf Alfasi. Over overwhelming, overwhelming and staggering losses for Claudi Israel. We um, overwhelming. We hope that their neshamas have an aliyah, that their families have an achama and halavai. Kalal Yisrael should have, should be able to stop offering up these precious karbonos each and every day, day after day, day after day. It's almost reminiscent of the Gemara Masechus Brachas that says that David HaMelech instituted a hundred brachas when there was a situation where Kalal Yisrael, people kept dying every day. And even though people dying every day is a natural course, is a natural course of the world, but at the end of the day, when we see such such brave and such holy and such special and dedicated young men, literally dying al kiddush Hashem day after day, it's a, it's a wake up call for the rest of us. So I will say, let's today, let's today, let's be makabel, daf pay dalit, daf pay bays in in Maseches Babakama. Let's let's pay attention today. Let's 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 be attentive. Let's not be distracted. You know, we have the opportunity to do something that these precious neshamas don't, which is the ability to sit in safety and security and learn the Ribbon HaShololom Torah. And we, should, we have to remember that. Every day we come here, we have the opportunity. These boys, these boys, these young men, have put their lives on hold to fight for Am Yisrael and for Eretz Yisrael. We don't have to put our lives on hold. Our lives, our lives, for the most part, are going on, are going on as usual. But if we have the opportunity to do the things day in and day out that they don't, then it behooves us to dedicate ourselves to those very things with a renewed sense of purpose. So they don't have this host to sit down for an hour in the morning and learn Gimar uninterrupted. So Chavra, I'm just asking, we should learn uninterrupted. What right do we have to be distracted by other things that are going on when we have the schuss to sit and learn? They don't have the schuss to come, schuss to come to shul to sit in davening, to sit in daven shachris. So again, we should take advantage of the opportunity and have kavana. My learning is for you. My davening is for you. But if we're going to take our spiritual service and use it for the benefit of another Jew, then it should be with undivided attention then it should be without distraction, then it should be with complete commitment. And if we exercise that level of discipline, commitment to the spiritual activities that we are engaging in, then in Merit Hashem, it should be a schus for Klav Yisrael, it should be a schus for our soldiers, it should be an aliyah for the Neshamas. And Halavai, Kodesh Baruch Hu should just bring this war to a decisive close, a victorious close, allow all of our soldiers, allow all of our hostages to go home to their families, B'Shalom and B'Karov. So I will say, let's, let's begin. Today's daf is Pei Beis 82, and we are picking up on Pei Aleph on the Beis 81b, and we are picking up at the two dots. Meis Mitzvah, Kona Makomo. So the halacha is that a Meis Mitzvah acquires the area upon which the body is situated. So I will say, so what this means, what this means in a practical sense, 
what this means in a practical sense is that the mixed mitzvah, remember again, is a body that has no one to bury it. So as such, so as such, there's no obligation to move it to a cemetery. You just bury it exactly where you find it. So the Gemara says, or Minu, is that true? Hamoti meis moto be'isratya. If a person finds a body that is literally in the Isratya, Isratya is a, is a Rishus Arabim, a public domain. So what's the halacha? Mifaneo li yamin. Li yamin Isratya, all the small Isratya. So this is talking about you find a body in the middle of Rishus Arabim. You can't bury someone in the middle of Rishus Arabim. So instead, what do you do? You move it to the right, you move it to the left. Sedei bar u sedei mir. So we'll say, so let's say again, there, now, once you're moving the body, once you're moving the body, so then halo the, 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 the Gemara is, is showing us options. If there's either the ability to bury the body in an unplowed field or in a plowed field, bar, you, you, you bury it in an unplowed field. Sedeinir u zera. What if it's a choice between a plowed field and a seeded or a sown field? near. you go ahead and you, you bury it in a plowed field, not in the sowed field. Sown field. How you stay and borrow, stay and niro, stay and zeros. What happens if both fields are the same? So you bury the body wherever you want. So we'll say, what's the point of this? What's the point of this Gemara? The point of this is you see that you do move a mace mitzvah. In other words, the Mishnah made it sound, I should say, the Takan of Yoshua, that mace mitzvah kanamakomo, so the Lashno, so that makes it sound like wherever you find the mace, that's where you bury it, and we don't move the body. But from here we see that we do move the body. So what's going on over here? Amra Bibi bemuta al Mitzar. Now the case of Rabbi says, if you could imagine, is where the body, the corpse itself, goes along the width of the Rosh Hashanah, to the point that it would be unable, people would be unable to pass through Rosh Arabim without going ahead and hovering over the body. Now, obviously, if you look at Rashi, Rashi says, So here's the, here's the problem. If you have a body that straddles Rosh Hashanah, right, that straddles with Rosh Hashanah, that, that's an unsustainable situation, because what's going to happen, essentially, Everybody who passes by Rosh Hashanah is going to become Tomei. You, you can't have a situation like that because there are Kohanim, there are people who are dealing with Taras. So this is like a public service issue. This is a public service issue. So therefore, essentially, we'll say this is one of these classic cases in Halacha where kind of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the individual. So the need of the Mes Mitzvah, so to speak, is to be buried right where he's found. But that goes against the needs of the Rabbim, of the collective. So in this case, the needs of the collective trumps the needs of the corpse of the individual, and we move the corpse. And now the Gemara is telling me, once you move it, you can move it to a place where burial is going to create the least amount of... Uh, I guess we'll call it disruption or damage upon someone else. Incredible. But Ultimately, again, since the body is 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 along the width of the Rosh Sarabim, you're allowed to move it. And once you're allowed to move it, you can move it anywhere you want. So the Gemara says, Omri, I, I mentioned this in yesterday's daf, Asara, both said these aren't ten enactments of Yoshua, rather what is it? So the Gemara says, Hani Chad Srihavyan. It's eleven. It's 11, or we'll say if you count it up, it's 11 enactments, not 10. So how do you reconcile this? So the Gemara says, Mahalchim b'shvile harashos shlomo omra. It was interesting. I'll say, if you remember again, one of the, one of the things that we mentioned was actually a, ta- a takana of the ability to go ahead and walk through fields after the harvest season, right? After the harvest season, before ultimately, again, anything else is planted, you're allowed to go ahead and walk through. We also mentioned, by the way, similar halacha, which is that when there are pot, we call it potholes, in the Rosh Hashanah, you could walk at the edge of the Rosh Hashanah, which is the Rosh Hashanah. So the Gemara says, in reality, Shalom Melech said, this kid is Sanya, Harishakalu Peros, Amin Asad, Ve'inom Maniach, Bnei Adam, Likanis, Besok, Sadeu, Ma Brios, Omer, Zalov, both say, if a person doesn't have any vegetation, person doesn't have any vegetation, Growing in his oh. I think it might just be maybe the internet is uh... okay, thank you. Person a person goes ahead and thank you. A person goes ahead and harvested all of his vegetation. So there's nothing growing in my field anymore. Right? And yet I still don't let people go ahead and walk through my field. 
I, what do people say about such an individual? So the Gemara says, Ma'abrios omros alof, ma'ano yish loploni, umabrios mazikos lo alof. We'll say, what, what, in other words, the, 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 the picture that the Gemara is painting over here, the Shalom Al-Khazid is, I finished harvesting my, my field, right? I haven't yet sown the field with the new seed, and yet I prevent people from walking on my field. What do people say about such a person? What do people say about such a person? I love a custom about such a person. The Pasuk says, Miyos tov avaltikrira. Right? Be good and don't be called bad. So the Gemara says, Vichit umik siv miyos tov avaltikrira. I will say, there's no such Pasuk like that. I mean, it would be a great Pasuk, but there is no Pasuk like that. Right? Miyos tov avaltikrira. Be good, don't, don't be bad. So the Gemara says, In ksiv ki ay gavna. It's written by a little bit of a different way. What's a different way? So al timna tov mibalov biyos li el yodecha laasos. Literally, again, don't withhold. Don't withhold good from your fellow when you have the ability to perform it. So we'll say the idea. So that 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 is a pasuk. That is a pasuk. So the Gemara says something so beautiful. Essentially, we'll say the idea is, if you could do something good for someone. And you don't, and you don't, that in and of itself, that in and of itself is sinful. Which I will say, such a, such a beautiful you sowed. In other words, in life, it's not just enough. What is it? What's the physicians of do no harm? Right? So, I, so it's, it, it's some it's paraphrasing, right? So, I say, so, so at, the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, like doing no harm is, is a great start, but that can't be the end of it. If you have the ability to do something good for someone, especially if they're doing something good for someone, doesn't really impact you, right? Doesn't really impact you, then how can you not take advantage of such an opportunity to bestow good? So again, my field, my field is harvested. I haven't planted anything. It doesn't really matter if people walk through it or not. Why not give them the opportunity? Why not give them the opportunity? So the Marsha Vesulak. So we'll say, I'll just point out it's it's interesting because sometimes this is a wonderful way. We'll say chesed isn't always easy. For, for many of us, chesed isn't easy. And the reason why chesed isn't easy is because as much as I believe that whatever I give to someone else is not, is not hurting me, right, or is not taking it from me, but the truth is it's, not, it's, hard, it's hard sometimes to believe that because at the end of the day, I do something for someone, I give of my time, I give of my resources, I don't have it for me. I don't have it for me. So, we'll say, so sometimes the kind of easier entry point into chesed is to think about the kind of things you can do for someone else that don't come at your expense. That don't come at your expense. And there are so many things on a daily basis that we could do for other people, right? That you're, 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 most of us are driving home anyway from work or from something. You think about two phone calls, one phone call that you can make to someone who's having a difficult time just to go ahead and let them hear your voice. Just a bigger cholim call or just a shalom aleichem call. It doesn't, it, you're, you're driving anyway. You're driving anyway. You're going ahead and spending the time anyway. It doesn't take away anything from you. The, shalom, so Shalom Aleichem instituted this idea that if you could do something good for someone else and it doesn't impact you in any negative way, why not? And that might be the easier, if a person struggles with becoming a Baal Chassid, that may be the easier entry point into things. Okay, in any event, the point the Gemara makes over here is that that particular enactment that was attributed to Yoshua, Yoshua didn't make it, rather again it was Shlomo HaMelech. Incredible. So the Gemara says, Vesulaka, are there no more enactments of Yoshua? So there's only ten. There are more. The more Zavaha Ika Rabbi Huda. This Rabbi Huda would just say Rabbi Huda Omer. This was some interesting other enactments. Bishas Hotzas Zvalim. When I will say, see, the way it would work is how would you fertilize the field? You would take all of the waste from your animals, right? And you would use that to fertilize your field. So at the time when it's time to fertilize the field, Adamotzi Zvaler Sarabim. So this is actually very interesting. Not sure exactly practically how this plays out, right? But Lamaisa, you could take essentially all of your manure, you could put it in a sarabim. Because apparently, again, the best way to use manure as fertilizer is to have it trampled. Stab it trampled. You can leave it there for 30 days. After 30 days, you go back, you collect your trampled manure, and now you have fertilizer. So you are allowed to take your manure and put it in Rosh Harabim. This is what Yoshua instituted.
This is what Yoshua instituted. Okay, so just another enactment of Yoshua. Next. Another enactment, another enactment. I have beeves, a beeves. I have bees, right? And my bees left my property and settled in the bow of the tree of Ruvain. So what's the halacha I will say? So instead of going to Reuven's yard and collecting my bees one by one, what could I do? I could cut off the bow of his tree, <coughs> take it back to my yard, take it back to my yard, get my bees back, and I have to go ahead and compensate Reuven for the lost bow. For the lost bow. But I'm allowed to go and remove the bow in order to save my bees. That was an enactment of Yehoshua. Okay, another example. Tanai Basin, another boss, another Tanai Basin, another, another. We'll say Tanai, remember, what does Tanai Basin mean? Tanai Basin means something that Basin, or in this case, where we're assuming Basin means Yoshua, something that Yoshua instituted as a, as, as a law or as a practice that even if it's not on the books in your particular locale, you are allowed to do that. By the way, the paradig- paradigmatic example of Tanai Basin, not made by Yoshua, but made by Chazal, is Ksuva. Is ksuva. Let's say, let's say, uh, right, the couple gets so excited at the chasana, everybody's so excited at the chasana, they forget to write the ksuva. So, what's the halacha? Now you have to write a ksuva because remember, again, we have a ta- Rav Paskin that a man is not permitted to live with his wife without a ksuva. So you have to write the document, but Lamaisa, the power of the ksuva, right, is, is in effect even if halacha Lamaisa, even if halacha Lamaisa, there is, there is no, even if halacha l'maysa, there is no um, document, the halacha still is there. The halacha, I'm sorry, the, the concept, the ksuva, ultimately still is there. So just an interesting idea. So another tonight basin, very interesting actually. So tonight basin, so, good. Tonight basin, who sh- three lines are from the bottom. She hezeh shofech yeyno, umatzel dufshano shal chavero, fenotel dmeyeno mesok dufshano shal chavero. So this is a fascinating case. Listen to this. Let's say I'm walking with a barrel of wine. My friend Ruvain is walking with a barrel of honey. Ruvain's barrel breaks. Ruvain's barrel breaks, ultimately again, and his honey begins to spill out. So I will say, what's the halacha? The Tanai Basin is, I, spill out, I'm, I should spill out my wine, rescue his honey, and retrieve the value of my wine from the honey. Now, this case, of course, presupposes that what? That honey is more valuable than wine. So what, I, what I'm allowed to do is just dump out the contents of my barrel, save the more expensive contents of Ruvain's barrel, and collect my repayment from honey. And I don't have to ask before I do this, right? I don't say, Ruvain, I'll pour out my wine, I'll pour out my wine, go ahead and get your honey, but just want to make sure that we're good. But rather, again, this is understood. Tanai Beisdin. Tanai Beisdin. Tanai Beisdin. Who she is Zema Farikas, eight of a twine pitch down shaver. Well, another another tonight basin. Most of us the tonight basin. Listen to this. My donkey is carrying wood. Ruvain's donkey is carrying linen or flax, right? And what, what happens? And what happens? Ruvain's donkey breaks down and dies, right? So now what could I do? I could offload my wood and take on his pishton. Now, again, presupposing that what? Pishtan, more expensive than wood. Same idea. And I could go ahead and I could take, and I could take ultimately again the value of my wood from his pishtan. Because I will say these are the conditions that Yoshua, that Yoshua predicated living in the land on. But say, I just want to point out something fascinating. If you notice, by the way, there's something dramatically different between this list and the previous list, right? In the previous list, they were almost all things that deal with the land. The land, right? These things don't really deal with the land. So what's unique about this, Rebbe say? It seems to be, according to this list over here, what's the power of Eretz Yisrael? Right? One, one of the powers of Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael is a Jewish homeland. In a Jewish homeland, in a land for Jews by Jews. So at the end of the day, the social fabric, right, the social contract between Jews is built into the land. 
That, that's the difference. This is a land where Jews are supposed to be able to live together in harmony. So what is, in, in these latest ones, what's happening over here? It's like it's understood. Your barrel of honey breaks. I'm going to pour out my wine to rescue your honey. You're going to pay back for me your honey. Because that's what we do. Cause, cause that, because that's how it works. Your donkey breaks down and your pishtun now is going to get ruined. I'm going to go ahead and offload my wood and rescue your pishtun because that's how a Jewish society works. A Jewish society is predicated upon people taking care of each other. That's what it means. That's what it demands. It's, it's incredible. So as beforehand, the first list, Yoshua is saying these are the way that, and it's all, it's all the same thing. All of the enactments, let's say if you, if you boil them all down to their common core, what is it? It's Yoshua saying, if you are going to exist here as a nation, you must learn to take care of one another. That's it. What is the secret to Jewish survival? The secret to Jewish survival is a willingness to take care of one another, a willingness to sacrifice for one another, a willingness to give to and give for one another. That's what Yoshua was trying to teach us through each of these incredible takanas. We'll say it's overwhelming. And it was true thousands of years ago, and it's just as true now. We'll say just, I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, but it's like, you think about this in just a moment, these precious soldiers who we learn for and who we remember every single day, I both say, what are they doing? They're willing to sacrifice for me and you. Then that's what it is, that they're willing to sacrifice. No soldier goes into battle without recognizing the potential price that he might have to pay. But he goes anyway, because he's willing to pay that price. He's willing to pay that price for the sake of something so much greater. The, these soldiers, they, they are the personification of the Tanai of Yoshua. Yoshua said, you're going to go into Eretz Yisrael, you must be willing and ready to give for one another. If you're willing to do that, you can live here. If you're not willing to do that, it's not going to work. We'll say, that's what it is. That's why the sacrifice is so enormous. Young people, young men with their whole lives ahead of them, with so many of them, families waiting for them back home. And yet, they're willing to give their lives, not, not just for the Jews who live 6,000 miles away, for us. For all of Kalal Yisrael, why? That's Tanai Yoshua. That's Tanai Yoshua. You want this land? You have to be willing to give one another. Overwhelming. And I will say, that's why it behooves us to figure out, like, what are we contributing to Kalal Yisrael? What are, everybody has to give something. Tanai Yoshua says, everybody has to be willing to give to the Kalal. What are you giving? What are you giving? No, not, not like yesterday. Today. Everybody has to be willing to give something to Klal Yisrael. You have to be contributing to the nation in some way. Fill in your blank. What is your contribution? And it could be anything. It could be the shachris that you're going to dive in with kavan. It could be the daf yomi that you're going to pay undivided attention to. It could be the tzedakah. It could be the chesed. It could be whatever you want. But every single day, you, each of us must be contributing something to the Klal. Because without that, we are not fulfilling our Tanai Yoshua, and without that, Klal Yisrael cannot retain Eretz Yisrael. It's overwhelming. Let's go back there. So Gemara says, so the point over here is, why do you go ahead and make it as a list of ten? Clearly, there are more Tanaim. So the Gemara gives an interesting answer. The Gemara says, "Be'echidai lo kamirin." Both say, if you look at all of these last cases over here, all of these last cases, these were all mentioned by individual opinions. So the Gemara is only reckoning. The Gemara is only reckoning. Ultimately, again, the list of Tanai of Tanai Yoshua that were agreed upon by the group by the group, but not just by individuals. Okay, it's the top of pay base. So kivaha kiyasa Rabbi Avin Amar Yochanan. So we'll say, yeah, whatever. Avin came to Rabbi Yochan, he said as follows. Uh, interesting case here. We'll say, if I have a tree that extends into my friend's yard, or a tree that, extend, that, that is right next to the border. Now, we'll say, if you have a tree that's right next to the border of two, of two, of two properties, the assumption is that the roots are extending into my neighbor's property and drawing sustenance from there. Excuse me, nevertheless, 
the Gemara said, maybe the Kore. Ultimately, again, the owner of the tree could still bring Bikurim and recite the Psukim. Sha'almanas kein hinchel Yoshua li Yisrael es ha'aretz. Because I will say this was the condition that Yoshua made when Cloud Yisrael came into Eretz Yisrael. That even if your tree is extending into someone else's property, or even if the roots of your tree ultimately again are going ahead and are extending into your friend's property, Lemaisi, you still bring Bikurim and you read the Psukim. Ela Mai, so the Gemara says, Ela Mai Tana Asar Tana Shisna Ishna Yoshua, Shehisna Yoshua. So I'll say, so what does it mean then when we said before, the, we'll say the point over here that Gemara is trying to make is there's more than 10. Right? There's more than 10. That at the end of the day, the list seems to be much greater, so, or, or greater. So the Gemara says, you're right. What does it mean when it says that these are the 10 tenaim that Yeshua made? Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who? We both said that reflected the view of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Gavim Beksil, Mastila Behedja, Rabbi Tancham, Rabbi Bryas, Mishum, Zakin Echad, Uman Rabbi Shoban Levi, Uman Rabbi Shoban Levi, Asar Tana and Hisna Yoshua. Okay, so we'll say, so Rabbi Shoban Levi is the one who came up with the list, ultimately again, that there were 10 enactments that Yoshua made. These were the 10, ultimately again, but please understand that there are others that are listed. There are others that are listed. Okay, so the Gemara goes right there. The Gemara says, Asara Takanos Tikin Yoshua, Tikin Ezra. So both say, so now, actually don't worry about it, it's okay. Yeah. So, 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 now, so now, interestingly enough, so both say, so that's the 10 Takanos of Yoshua. Now, the truth is, we have to go back because there are some things that we still have to speak about with, with a little bit greater depth. We have to go back to Behemoth Daka, which again was a uh, Sunday's daf. We have to go back to that a little bit more. But let's just let's let's finish up a little bit more Gimara and then Amir Tashem will try to see if we if we have time to dabble in halacha a bit. So we'll say, so now now that we were talking about Takanas, so let's talk about Takanas of Ezra. A really fascinating Gimara. So watch this. So the Gimara says, Asara Takanos Tikin Ezra. Ezra instituted 10 things as well. What are the 10 institutions? What are the 10 things that Ezra instituted? Number one, Tikin Ezra Shekhar Mincha B'Shabbos. Ezra instituted laning. Be'Shabbos Mincha. V'Korin B'Sheni B'Chamishi. Ezra instituted that we lane on Mondays and Thursdays. V'Donin B'Sheni B'Chamishi. Ezra also instituted ultimately again that we adjudicate cases that Bezin sits in session on Mondays and Thursdays. Ezra instituted that people should launder their clothing on Thursday. Ezra instituted that you should eat garlic on Erev Shabbos. Ezra instituted that women should, bake, should wake up early to bake. Again, that's, that's, right, that seems to be, right? right? <laughs> Yes, it's going to be a popular one. It's going to be a popular one, right? So I'll say, so again, we'll talk about, it's interesting because that doesn't seem to be limited to a day of the week, right? That seems to be, right, every day we'll talk about that. So the Gemara says, isha chogeres pisinar, that a woman should wear a belt. Vishitehe isha chogeres pisinar, we'll see actually, sinar really means undergarments. That a woman will say has to do chafifa before she goes to the mikvah. Chafifa is the process of really, literally, it's of combing the hair. But really, what it what it really means, or at least for us contemporarily, is the process of cleaning the body and checking it for any chatzitzos, for any interpositions, things that may go ahead and cause a problem with the tevila. That spice merchants should go ahead and and go throughout the city. Ezra instituted that a man who has a seminal mission should go to the mikvah. All right, so we'll say so a lot a lot going on over here. So let's analyze this. She so we'll say so. Enactment number one: Ezra instituted that you should read that you should lean on Shabbos Mincha. Why? Because of Yoshve Kronos. Now we'll say now it's interesting. What does Yoshve Kronos mean? If you take a look at Rashi, Rashi says or Yoshve Kronos are Yoshve Chanuyos. It's interesting because usually Yoshve Kronos literally means what? People who sit in the corner, it usually, it's usually a reference to people who are wasting away their lives. 
right? Literally, again, sitting in the corner is doing absolutely nothing. So Rashi understands over here that no, it means to shop owners, shopkeepers. Why Rashi is listening to this? oskin So tikun beginayhu kriya yisera. So say this is incredible. We're going to see there are people who are occupied with business. This is incredible. People are occupied with business. So those individuals often even on Mondays and Thursdays may not have the opportunity to come to shul. So for them, Ezra instituted an additional Torah reading on Shabbos afternoon, the day Shabbat, which I will say highlights a very important episode. I will say for those of us who work during the week, Shabbos is for learning. Right? Shabbos is for learning. This is a very important yisod, right? So, so for Tamidi Chachamim, Shabbos is to catch up on their rest. For the rest of us who aren't Tamidi Chachamim, who are working during the week, Shabbos is to catch up on our learning. Right? While we're true, we're learning during the week, but again, there's often not enough time to really learn during the week. It's very important. Shabbos is to be utilized, whether it's the long Shabbos night, long Friday night, or during the summer, the long Shabbos day, to really be utilized, not to catch up on my rest. Or you can catch up on your rest also, but, right, but to be utilized to catch up on my learning. So Ezra instituted this additional Kriya on Shabbos afternoon for the people who are working during the week, didn't necessarily have time to even make it to shul on Mondays and Thursdays. They should have an extra learning, and she have extra learning on Shabbos afternoon. So beautiful. So we'll say, so again, I'm supposed to so delaying, so delaying on Mondays and Thursdays. Ezra Tiki, did Ezra really, t- was Ezra the one who instituted leaning on Mondays and Thursdays? I will say, this was already instituted earlier on, this actually a beautiful Gemara de Sanya. I will say, Kral Yisrael traveled three days in the desert and did not find water. I will say, this week's parasha. This week's parasha, parasha is B'Shalach. Absolutely incredible. This is right after the Yam Suf, right? This is when they came to Mara. Right, so ultimately they're traveling three days in the desert and they could not find water. We'll say this is a beautiful Gemara. Darshe Rishumos Amru, those who Darshan Psukim said, A Mayim El Torah. They both say, what's water? Water is Torah. Water is Torah. Right? They both say, just like you cannot live without water, I cannot live without the Torah. Shene'emar. Hai called samei l'chul l'mayim. Right? Every thirsty person go to water. Sometimes a person is so spiritually thirsty, I need Torah. Kevan shalchu shloch shesam below Torah. Nilu. Both say what was happening. So both say on, 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 a, on a drusha level, what was happening? Kalali, so I was traveling in the desert, and we went three days without Torah. Three days without Torah. And both say what happens when you go three days without Torah? You become spiritually dehydrated. Truth is, you go one day without Torah, a person is spiritually dehydrated. You go one morning without Dafyomi, and already again a person gets the shakes. Right? They all say, so, so, so Lamaisa, so Lamaisa, right? So now they went three days, they went three days, and they didn't have Torah. So what happened? So the Gemara says, Amdu Nevi'im Shebeneihem, the prophets amongst them, i.e. Moshe Rabbeinu, got up and instituted a Tiknu Lohan, Sheikhorin Bishabis, Umaf Sikin Be'achar Bishabis, the Korin Besheni, Umaf Sikin Bishlishi, or Avi, the what did Moshe Rabbeinu institute? Moshe Rabbeinu instituted, essentially, you're going to lane, and you're going to learn Torah Monday, Thursday, and Shabbos. This way again, This way again, a Yid never goes more than three days without Torah. That's what was instituted. But what's the point? The point over here is Ezra didn't institute this, right? This was already in times of Moshe Rabbeinu. So what's going on? I will say second wide line, Pei Be'a Medalef 82a, Me'ikara Tiknu Chad Gavrat Klasa Psuke. In the beginning by Moshe Rabbeinu, all they instituted was one aliyah, so to speak, with three psukim. Inami Tlasa Gavri Tlasa Psuke. Or they would call up three people with just three psukim. And what happened? Keneged Kohanim Levim Yisraelim. Asahu, Ezra came along, and what was he attacking? Asahu, Tikin Tlasa Gavri, Vasara Psuke, Keneged Asara Batlanen. So I will say Ezra was the one who instituted it as we have it today, which is a bit more robust, i.e., three aliyahs with a total, with a minimum of 10 psukim. So whereas Moshe Rabbeinu introduced the concept of of institutionalized Torah learning on Mondays, Thursdays, and Shabbos, 
Ezra did two things. Number one, he added an additional one on Shabbos afternoon for the very busy shopkeepers. And number two, he made it more robust. Three aliyahs with a minimum of 10 psukim each. In Karabah, why 10? Keneged asara batlanim, right? Corresponding to the 10 batlanim. I both say, now, it's not what you think batlanim. It's like, oh yeah, I know those guys. The asara batlanim, right? I was in yeshiva with them, right? No, that, that, that's, not, that's not, in this case, batlanim is actually a compliment. Batlanim refers to the 10 people who were paid by the community to be up to, to, to it was essentially the community colo, the community colo, the community colo. What, what, what was their job? Their job was to remain in the shul to ensure that there would always be a minion. Again, those individuals were paid by community funds because they were providing a community service of making sure that there was always an available minion. Good. Let's go back there. Vidanim b'sheni v'chamishi. So we'll say Ezra instituted that based him would sit in session on Mondays and Thursdays. Why? The shrichi the asul mikra b'sifra. Right. Ultimately, again, we'll say. So remember. Mondays and Thursdays were the market days, were the market days, and this way again, this way again, I will say, now Mondays and Thursdays are also laning days. So now, what Ezra is really doing is kind of, we'll say, it's so smart. The way, the way to bolster spirituality is how, is how, it's fascinating, is don't make it conflict with Parnassa. Don't make it conflict with the other parts of life. Both say, this is the most important thing in general, in general, right? If Yiddishkeit is always at odds with the other things I have to do in life, so Lamaisa Yiddishkeit is going to lose. The goal in life is to create something harmonious. Harmonious, right? Harmonious with, with, with between my, the rest of my life and Yiddishkeit. And Ezra, in his, in his profound wisdom, understood, so don't put Yiddishkeit at odds with peak commerce. So what do you do? So make leaning days, which days? Mondays and Thursdays. Why Mondays and Thursdays? Why Mondays and Thursdays? People are coming to the marketplace anyway. Keep the but they didn't open when? Mondays and Thursdays. Because now, again, people are coming to the marketplace. They're coming for Torah reading. So anyway, so keep everything, keep everything harmonious. And if you could build, if you could create a harmony between Yiddishkeit and the rest of your life, so everything, everything benefits. So the Imam goes like, I'm sorry, Ezra Institute, you should launder your clothing on Thursday. Why? Mishum Kavad Shabbos. But say ultimately again, because this way a person will have clean clothing for Shabbos Kodesh. Erev Shabbos, she eat garlic on Erev Shabbos, Mishum Ona. Interesting from us, this was because of intimacy. Remember, the Gemara says, Dichsev Asher Pirio Yitim Bito, Parv Yehuda Vitim Rav Nachman, Vitim Rav Kana, Vitim Rav Yochran, Zeh. Hamishamish mitasa me erev Shabbos the erev Shabbos. I will say there is a mitzvah of owner, right? A man has an obligation of physical intimacy towards his wife. So remember, we saw Mesachas Ksuvis that depending on your profession, that determines the frequency of your intimacy obligation. Tamidi Chachamim, their owner is Friday night, every Friday night. So both say so. So because of that, because of that, apparently garlic is good for intimacy. I'm assuming you wash your mouth out, right? Right, right, right. right? But, 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 lamaisa, but, lamaisa, garlic is good. Garlic is good for intimacy. Why? What's the Pshat Gemara? There are five qualities that are said about garlic. Masbia, it satiates. Mashkin, Mashkin Rashi says it warms up the body. Matzhil Panim, ultimately, again, it causes like a more radiant countenance. Umar Behazera, and literally again, it's marbe it causes it causes an increase, an increase to zera, an increase to semen. Vahore kinim she bebnei me'ayim, and it kills, I guess, some intestinal stuff. Veish omrim machnis ava umotzias akina. This is interesting. And some say garlic has the unique ability to literally instill one with love and get rid of jealousy. Get rid of jealousy. That last part is the best part, right? So I will say, if, if only, if only it was, if only it was that easy. I will say now, the truth is, it could also very well be that when you look at the other qualities of of garlic. So again, you put all of these things together. That puts a person in a good mood, right? If a person shalom bayis, intimate life is in a good place, and ultimately a person feels satiated, a person feels warm, they don't feel cold, a person has a nice complexion, right? All of these things, you put all of these things together, what happens? Mach a person is in a good mood. I will say, this is such a profound idea. What happens when you're in a good mood? I will say, what happens when you're in a good mood? You're not jealous. 
you're not jealous. I will say if you think about it so often, jealousy in life doesn't really stem from the fact that someone has something that I don't, right? Because in life, there's always someone who has something that I don't. Where does jealousy stem from? Real jealousy stems from, I'm not happy with me. I'm not happy with me. If I was really happy with myself, really happy with myself, if I felt that I was living a good and meaningful and impactful life, and I was firing on all cylinders, I'm not jealous in this situation. Okay, so this guy has this car, this guy has this house, this guy has this vacation, this guy's okay, very nice, enjoy it, enjoy it. I'm happy, I'm good. When you're jealous, when you're jealous, that's a telltale sign that you're just not happy with who you are, what you are, the life that you're living. So I will say that last line is really, really, really profound. Machnis Ava, if, if you're happy and, and right, you have, you have love towards yourself, you're happy with who you are, what you are in the life you're living, Motsi es Ultimately, again, you don't really have jealousy. And that's why I will say, sometimes the way we feel towards others is the most incredible barometer about how we feel about ourselves. If you're the kind of person, if, if I'm feeling jealous, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling negative towards other people, usually it has almost nothing to do with anyone else and has everything to do with the fact that deep down I know I'm not living the best life I could. I'm not the best version of myself. Be happy with yourself, and ultimately, again, you're mostly with the kin, and you find happiness with everyone else around you as well. Incredible. So what was I woman should wake up early and bake? Why? This is incredible. So that when the aniyim come to the door collecting, you have bread to give them. Then I will say now, this is very much aligned with the Gemara that says that sometimes the highest form of tzedakah is not money. But if you know that, it, uh, that an ani is hungry, right, the poor person is hungry, and you can give him food instead of money to go buy food, that's a higher level of tzedakah. So therefore, the ability to have food that's ready to be dispensed, ultimately, again, that a woman should wear undergarments. This was a din in modesty. Okay? A woman should do a chafifa, right? Should comb her hair, check her body for any interpositions before she goes to the mikvah. The Gemara says, that's not Ezra, that's Doraisa. That's a biblical obligation. The Sanya. The Torah, when speaking about immersion, says a person has to wash their flesh in the water, which means the boss or the flesh has to come in direct contact with the water. There can't be any chatzitza. There cannot... There can't be any chatzitza. There can't be any chatzitza. There can't be any interposition between one's body and the water. Es besaro. Furthermore, the pasuk says es besaro, and es is a ribui. The gemara says es hatafa lo besaro. It means even that which is secondary to your flesh must also be free of any interpositions. And what is that? Umaynihu sear. That means hair. So we'll say, so you see over here that what? That bidaraisa, hair has to be free from chatzitzas, which is why a woman has to comb out her hair, right? And her body has to be free from any chatzitzas, from any interpositions. This is why she takes a bath, and this is why she physically inspects herself. To which the says, you're right. Amri, daraisa li'iyune dilma mikdar, inami maos midi mishum chatzitza. We'll say, midaraisa, all a person needs to do is what? It's actually interesting. Midarai, so all they need to do is inspect. Right? So Midarai, so a woman just has to look at her hair to make sure that it is free from chatzitza. She has to look at her body to make sure that it's free from chatzitza. That is the Da'arai. So Amadez, Amadez. Va'asra Ezra, v'tikin chafifa. Ezra came along and what did Ezra indicate or what did Ezra legislate? Ezra legislated combing. Combing. Ezra said a woman actually has to comb her hair. Comb her hair. Okay, so most like good. That's it. Vishay Rochlin, Machzir Bayaros, and that spice merchants should be allowed to, to sell their wares in the city. Mushum Tachshite Nashim, Shalo Yisganu Al Bale. And I both say, this is interesting. Um, with this system of here is like this. You might have thought, you might have thought, let's say this, let's say the city has a store that sells spices, like perfumes we're talking about over here. So maybe traveling merchants shouldn't be allowed to come into the city. Hasagas, Gvul, right? They're impacting someone else's parnasa. 
Ezra said, when it comes to traveling perfumers, right, they could always come and go. Why? This is a benefit to Shalom Bayis. Because this way, again, a woman could easily secure perfume. And because she could per- she secure perfume, she'll be attractive to us. Also, remember, also understand hygienic standards are different. So people weren't necessarily bathing every single day. So because of that, perfume becomes even more necessary just for Shalom Bayis. So in order to facilitate Shalom Bayis, Ezra said, let the perfum- perfumers, perfumers, yeah, so, so, uh, enter into the city and sell their wares. Vitike and Tfil about carry. And we'll say another interesting case. So Ezra instituted, ultimately, again, that a man who has a seminal emission has to go to the mikvah. The Gemara says, one second, da'oraisa, that's a da'oraisa, that a man who has a seminal emission has to go to the mikvah. Dechsev ve'ish kiseit se'in imenu shechvas zera v'rachatz es b'serah b'mayim. So what we'll say, the says, if a man has a seminal emission, he has to go to the mikvah. So what do you mean, Ezra instituted it? Which says, you're right. The Gemara says, Daraisahu l'chuma l'kadshin. You're right. It is Daraisa. So when does the Torah mandate immersion for a seminal emission? So we'll say, that's if you're going to eat truma, or you're going to eat karbanos, then you have to go to the mikvah prior to consumption. Also, who tikin afilu l'divrei Torah? They will say, Ezra instituted it, that what? That ultimately, again, after a man has a seminal emission, you have to go to the mikvah even before learning Torah. So they will say, this is what's called Takanas Ezra. Now, the Gemara explains why did Ezra institute this? Shelo yehei tamidi chachamim mitsuyin eitzon mishosein ketarna golin. That literally, tamidi chachamim should not be intimate with their wives like chickens. Apparently, chickens mate frequently, right? So in order that, in order that tamidi chachamim, you know, should approach even permitted intimacy with a certain level of COVID rosh, a certain level of seriousness, there is a mandated tvila every time a man has a seminal emission. Now, I will say, there, there's, there's a lot to talk about with this. So what, what, what happened to this today? Right? Again, so Ezra was metakin. Every single time a man has a seminal emission, he's going to be in chasidim. So just so you should understand, this is why by the chasidim, right, they go to the mikveh every single day, right? There are, there are Jews who are not fit to go to the mikveh every single day because of takonas Ezra. Again, if we have a little bit of time, for sure not today. But in Merit Hashem, so just Somebody, somebody keep this running list of fascinating halachic topics we have to go back to. So, right, Behemoth Daka, we have to go back to. Takanas Ezra, we have to go back to. So, again, why this is not as widely practiced today, all right, Mishnah, we're as a whole discussion, we'll come back to it, Emirates Hashem. Let's go back there. Asar Dram Nemru Yerushalayim. Let's say, if we can't be in Yerushalayim yet, then Emirates Hashem, we should be Zoha, we are at least we're Zoha to learn the Torah of Yerushalayim. Ten things said about Yerushalayim Yerak Kodesh. Number one, Eina Bayis Chalutba. So we'll say number one, very quickly, let's talk about these things. We'll say the halakha normally is that if you sell, if you, if you sell a home in a walled city, remember we'll say in general, when you sell real estate in Eretz Yisrael, you're not, it's not really a sale, really what is it, what is it effectively? It's a long-term lease, right? Everything goes back at Yovel. The exception to that rule is homes in walled cities. If you sell a home in a walled city, you have one year to redeem it. If you do not redeem it, then what? Then ultimately, again, it becomes the property of the new owner forever and does not return at Yovel. Why is a walled city different? The Sefer HaChinuch explains very beautifully that walled cities were often border cities. Were border cities. Border cities are the first line of defense. We, we, we saw this, right? The border, border cities are the first line of defense. So in order for those cities to be properly defended, the residents have to know each other, and the residents have to be able to work together with each other. Therefore, you cannot have constant turnover in border cities. You just can't have it. So that's why Sefer HaChinuch says, you sell property in a border city, in a walled, in a walled city, you have one year to redeem it, if you don't, it forever becomes the property of forever becomes the property of the new owner. So we'll say, even though Yerushalayim is not a border city, it's a capital city, right? So fine. So, so therefore, in Yerushalayim, we'll say Yerushalayim is not like that. Rather, in Yerushalayim, ultimately, again, even if you sell property, it goes back to the owner. Ultimately, again, during Yovel. 
during Yovel. Good. Both say if you find a, a dead body and the, it's closest to the city of Yerushalayim, right? The elders of Yerushalayim, they don't bring an Egla Rufa. There's no Egla Rufa brought for Yerushalayim. Remember again, Egla Rufa, you find the dead body between two cities, measure the closest city. The elders of that city come out, decapitate a calf, calf, wash their hands over the calf. That Allah doesn't apply to Yerushalayim. Next. Yerushalayim cannot become an Yerushalayim. We'll say Yerushalayim is a city in which all of the inhabitants have worshipped Avodah Zarah. A city like that is laid waste. We destroy it. We destroy it. We kill the inhabitants. And we destroy anything and everything in the city itself. Yerushalayim cannot become an Yerushalayim. The Enumatai bin Egoim, Yushalayim, the homes of Yushalayim cannot contract Tumas Saras. Normally, even a home could be afflicted with saras, with leprosy, which are loosely translated as leprosy, but ultimately, homes in Yerushalayim cannot contract saras. We'll see the reason for all this. Yerushalayim will say you can't have beams that extend or porches, like balconies, that extend from buildings in Yerushalayim. Vein osin ba ashpasos. You cannot make garbage dumps in Yerushalayim. Vein osin ba kivshonos. You cannot make furnaces in Yerushalayim. Vein osin ba ganos upardesin. Interesting. You cannot go ahead and make gardens and orchards in Yerushalayim. Chutz mi ganos vraden shahayu mi mos nevim Yerushalayim. With the exception of the rose gardens that existed from the time of the early prophets. Vein megadlin ba tarnagolim. And ultimately, again, you can't raise chicken. In Yerushalayim, we already saw this. Vein malinin boas hames, and ultimately, again, you cannot go ahead and leave a corpse unburied in Yerushalayim overnight, right? You will say, so we know this to this very day. They don't leave the dead unburied in Yerushalayim overnight. Okay, so I will say now let's go through this entire list. So I will say, so what is this doing over here? Remember, once we're in the Gemara, is about lists, right? Lists, lists of Yoshua, lists of Ezra. So now here, ten unique qualities about Yerushalayim. So let's go. So we'll say, so remember again, if you, even though Yerushalayim is a walled city, if you sell property and you don't redeem it in the first year, right, the home does not remain the permanent property of the purchaser. Rather, it goes back to the original owner at Yobel. I'll tell you why, because the Pasuk says, the So we'll say, so ultimately, generally in a walled city, so the Torah says, when somebody buys the home in a walled city, so the home which is situated in a city which has a wall, Litzmisus will become forever the property of the purchaser. Vekasavar lo nischalka Yerushalayim lishvatim. Now I will say we're going to see that ultimately the common denominator amongst all these things is as follows. When the Torah describes when the Torah describes ultimately again that about, about a city, about a walled city, so we'll say it's referring to a city that's that, that's tribal property, right? Belongs to one of the Shvatim. Yerushalayim was not divided amongst the Shvatim. And I will say, this, this is a very important episode. As much as Yerushalayim lies between the tribal areas of Yehuda and Binyamin, in fact, the line between Yehuda and Binyamin actually goes through the Kodesh HaKadoshim, goes through the Holy of Holies, right? At the end of the day, Yerushalayim belongs to all of Klal Yisrael. It does not belong to any one Shevet. It belongs to everyone. So therefore, I will say, essentially what we're going to see is that any any halacha that applies to tribal land, Yushalayim is exempt from because Yushalayim is not tribal land. So the halacha concerning a sale of a home in a walled city applies to a walled city that is tribal land. But because Yushalayim was not divided up amongst the Shvat, and rather it belongs to everyone, therefore halacha lemaisa, halacha lemaisa, the din of the sale of a home in a walled city does not apply to Yushalayim. Similarly, you don't bring an Egla roof in Yushalayim, why not? If you will find the corpse in one of the areas that Achilles Baruch was giving you as an inheritance, meaning that it's part of Yerush, part of Eretz Yisrael that was divided up amongst the Shvatim, Yerushalayim lo nischal kol Shvatim. Yerushalayim was not divided up amongst the Shvatim. Rabbi was like, we'll have to stop over here for today. We'll pick up with the rest of this list, but at least you begin to see a theme over here that any halacha, any halacha which is predicated on an area below 
belonging to the Shvatim ultimately again does not apply to Yushalayim because Yushalayim ultimately was not divided. So there was a Shkoyach, stop ever take it to you tomorrow. Incredible. All right, have a great day, everyone. Internet looks like it. Uh,